Okay, uh, Santiago, the floor is yours. Wow, oh, they're going to give the students money so that they keep <laughs> away. I, I, I did want to say, uh, by way of further introduction, Santiago has uh, had a long personal friendship with John Fitz, and uh, I asked him to really kind of share his uh, understanding of how Finnis approaches this task of presenting this, this classic natural norm position. Absolutely. There's a couple of students who are just coming. Have you invited them to your birthday celebration? <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> have you brought uh, your investor uh, gift? You made it on that. Or is that how it bounces? <laughs> is this anonymous grading you have? <laughs> well, it's not out of bounds. It's anonymous grading. Sure, maybe not. Well, actually, it really isn't anonymous grading. Yes, with the papers, I got to know who wrote the paper. Well, I will say that, fortunately, our, the quality of our students has increased. The quality at least. Quality, thanks so much. Well, yes, yes. There were times in the past where I, my generosity was outweighed by my rationality. <laughs> so I have to, I have to try to be as generous as possible, as possible within the confines of what it is to be a reasonable person. So that's the challenge. Do you keep uh, participation points? No, but I, I, I get, everyone gets a good starting point. In other words, we start with the prospect that I, if I, I give the highest grades, I can. Okay, that's the, the but only there are times when the uh, grain is lower because there's a kind of a scale. It's a high scale. But it's a scale. So sometimes you run out of good grades. So. Mm -hmm. And then I, little factors kind of weigh into the process. People who got the paper in on time, yes, yeah, a little bit of an edge of somebody who did, but not just a little tiny bit. Well, there, there have been people who did not have it in on time. Yes, and one of the best papers I ever got. 30 years of teaching this course came from somebody who was late. So if you're late, very good. I could I forgive that. <laughs> wow. That means if you're very good and you're not late, that must be awesome. No, it's it's uh it look, grading is an art more than a science. Just like morality has got its uncertainty, well, grading has its uncertainty. So I always like to say, I don't grade the student, I grade the product, I grade the paper. And that's a very important distinction because sometimes you have a bad day and you, and you write a paper that's short of what you might write. And it's not where you begin in life and matters, it's where you finish. <laughs> so uh, school is only the beginning point. And I can tell you, I've met many a student who was brilliant as a student and flopped as a lawyer. And conversely, uh, we've had students who just got up with the skin of their teeth, turned out to be very good lawyers. So it's not... The best people are always the best students. But there is a corollary between being a good student and being a good one. Definite corollary. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now we are ready. Good evening, everyone. It's very good to be here again. Thank you so much for the renewed trust and for the invitation. Especially thank you for bringing your brother Michael. No, you were Michael. <laughs> Yes. You may wonder why they are here. You will soon know. This is going to be a very useless presentation in the sense that nothing of what I'm going to say in this roughly 30 minutes, followed by a short conversation with you, hopefully, will be useful for your papers. Nothing, I promise. From this, it should follow. Very good. You're going in the right direction. <laughs> From this, it should follow that you won't need to take notes now, because the only reason you have a laptop is to take notes. I kindly invite you to proceed downwards and engage me in this conversation. You may think this is unfair because I'm telling you, you won't need to take notes. I'm telling you this is useless and I've just deprived you of your one opportunity for destruction if I am a bore. 
Now, this is why I brought the twins. Whenever you get bored or distracted, you play the seven game difference. And you tell me at the end of this class, what are the seven differences between these two gentlemen here? Having said which, I am starting now, thanking you for having played the game. I will talk to you about the man behind the theory with the very, very faint hope that you might fall in love with him. I don't know what you make of polygamy <laughs> or others, polyamorous uh, loving affairs, but this person is married, I warn you, and has to top it all six children. The firstborn, exactly my age, and the last born, the age of some of you, I suppose. I mean, some of you seem to me to be in your 20s. I hope I'm not being extremely generous. I'm sure I'm not. So this is John Mitchell Finnis, born in Southwest Australia in the year, give or take months, the twins were born in New Jersey these twins. And it is John Mitchell Finnis what has united this here twin and I in the following way. I came one time to give a lecture to one of the Manhattan-based universities. They are all the same, so I won't even mention it. They don't really matter. Well, maybe except for one. And I was having breakfast at the house of my then host, and I mentioned the name of Phoenix. There were several people. And then someone who was in the table and then taught here at Seton Hall Law, who taught tax here, I think, Mr. or Professor John Coverdale, who retired not so long ago, said to me, you like John Phoenix? And I said, I love John Phoenix. I told you already, I have no objection to it long distance polyamorous kind of relationships, same sex. Um, then he said, you should meet my friend, Michael Ambrosio. And the other day I was checking my emails and like three days later, I was having a breakfast somewhere close to his house in the Southern tip of Manhattan. And he said, Michael said, next time you come to the United States, as I live in Argentina, I mean, let me know and I'll bring you over and you'll give a talk at Seton Hall Law on Finnis, which I did, as you know now, twice. Finnis himself gave a talk here, perhaps in the Q&A, Professor Ambrosio can expand on the reaction he received here by the likes of you, although you were not born, and the likes of your professors, although they were not born, except for Paula Francesi, who doesn't age, but told me here today that she started teaching in 1996. So she might have been here when Phyllis came, yeah. 1996. No, she wasn't. She Phyllis came in 1984. 1984. 1985. Yeah. She just, she just was. So today when I arrived in the building, I was introduced by Michael to someone who I mistakenly took to be one of your associate deans because I saw the word associate on his door, but he's an associate professor. What's his name again? Richard Winchester. Richard Winchester. I just saw him going up. And then when I mentioned that I was here because of the name Finnis, he said, oh, that's your affinity. And I spoke to you with that then in my, in my Anne Green Gables imagination. Yes, that's our affinity. I was thrilled, by the way, by Professor Paula over lunch about Phoenix and everything I'm about to tell you now. No, I didn't ask her to come because she already knows it. <laughs> Mind you, Phoenix spent two years of his life in Malawi and was the first dean of the first law school in this East African country. And um, I guess I'm saying this because since 2012, I've taught in 
Kenya, or as Michael said, Kenya. Kenya would be the out of Africa, Meryl Street, Robert Redford pronunciation of Kenya. Now, you don't say Kenya if you go to Kenya, unless you're a British settler. You say Kenya. That's the way that those Swahili speakers like the restaurant were going to pronounce the name. So I've been teaching in Kenya a, a short course uh, every year for 12 years now. And, and yes, when I told Finis that I had started doing these courses there, he was very excited because he started his stint in Malawi, landing in Nairobi and driving with his wife and kids all the way to Malawi, from Nairobi to the capital of Malawi, I don't remember the name. The book you have there and you have there was actually finished on a boat around the Malawi Lake that I confused with the Indian Ocean the first time I did Johannesburg, Nairobi in then successful airline, South African Airways, now more or less dead, like half or most. Well, um, he was brought up a light Anglican kind of Protestant Christian in Australia. And after the dim light of so many others, progressively or regressively lost his faith. And by law school years in Australia, he had become an agnostic and a, an avid reader of Friedrich Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and other nihilist uh, writers. You know, the United States is the only country in the world, maybe except for some parts of Canada, where law is not an undergraduate degree. Everywhere else, including common law jurisdictions like the UK or Australia, and of course, Europe, Argentina, where I'm based, you start law at the age of 18. So Finnis started at the age of 18 and he was very lost at the time. Lost, that is, he didn't think he was lost. Lost the way he saw it later. Or lost, if you compare with the views that he endorsed later in that, his first of five books published in 1980, the book for you. But, but what had to happen for there to be a conversion? Pray tell me, it's in all the films. Maybe you've experienced it, certainly not you, my friend you know, just for a change. In fact, you know, I'll give them like 30 seconds and then I'll call, as in not call, call, but call. <laughs> we'll be 20 now. So easy, but I know you're shy, of course. What's the question now? My question is what had to happen for Finns to change, convert, and become your hero and mine, and not the nihilist agnostic that he was? Now, if you're if the answer, if everyone doesn't have it like this, maybe they haven't experienced he fell in love. Love, of course. Is it love that I'm feeling? That kind of thing. I think he will find out on his own, right? Think so. And what else do you think? Love, not for a dog or a cat, but let's see. Let's see how subtle now your mind is. His wife? Well, his wife to be, but that's easy. I mean, the subtle, the subtlety has to lie somewhere having to do with the book, maybe, or something like that, right? Or with the opposite of niche, what wife to be would this have to be for her to operate this 
migration. Let me let me give you an example of my friend who told me that when his father met his mother, who had been a nun, N U N, for a while, and then left the how do we call it nunhood, nunnery, yeah, and he proposed. He was like finished then. She said, we get married on condition that first, what? What's your name? Regan. Regan, what? You convert to Catholicism. Exactly. You become a Catholic. Otherwise, there is no way. It was, it was a nun. That's classic. And what did he do? Did he become a Catholic? I don't know. But did he sign all the papers? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> First of all, communion, the whole package, seat on Paul, Thomas More, chapel, you know, the whole thing. Well, Dennis, I met his wife only recently. Like, I met her in July of this year. And, uh, yeah, she is a daily mass goer, but now he is too. The interesting thing is that he became a Catholic and started to have a faith in what some of you, like Professor Ambrosio, believe, for example, the Eucharist. You know how if you go to that little room called the St. Thomas More Chapel, I just went there earlier today, there is a box to the right in the back with a red light called a tabernacle, Catholics believe that God is entrapped in there. So before Finis believed this, that is in between, he's being a pagan, a radical pagan, and becoming a lover, and therefore a Catholic and a believer in the whole package, in between, he had an intellectual conversion to natural law, courtesy of a pagan, Aristotle, another pagan before him, Plato, and courtesy of some saints. But when he was reading these saints, like St. Thomas Aquinas, he was thinking, this strikes me as sound, but how can it be if it is proposed by a monk? A monk means darkness to me, he thought. You see, because love hadn't hit him yet. Then love destroyed the whole edifice of his former non-beliefs, and then there was an alignment and no more objections to Aquinas' monk side. Now, the other great influence had is of a 20th century philosopher that is very dear to your professor, whose birthday is tomorrow, and therefore you have been spared not only of singing him happy birthday, maybe, but also of bringing him today again in my country, if you would have brought him today, the witches would punish us all. You do it after the, the birthday itself. You know, we never congratulate someone in our country before the day. But 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 that's right. I just heard there is class next Tuesday. So uh, any any gift above fifty bucks, you should refuse. <laughs> but there is, if there is, if there are some biscuits here given by anyone except for this gentleman here. You should accept. <laughs> yes, this person is called Bernard Lonergan. My impression from Reagan is that the name has been uttered here, which is not the same as to say that you remember it all. This Bernard Lonergan, a Jesuit, a Jesuit 
priest was very instrumental for Phoenix's intellectual journey and understanding of Aristotle and Aquinas. And because he was a Jesuit priest and now love was kicking, maybe the first of the six kids was already on his way, aptly named John Paul after the new Pope in 1979. Well, Lonergan, you have a chair here, right? We do. And you have Lonergan scholars and we had three lectures. You had three lectures. Lonergan. Lonergan. So if sometime over the summer or for your paper, you actually read or indeed have read Finnis's book and you find it difficult, wait and touch Lonergan. <laughs> then you will realize that Finis is a piece of cake <laughs> compared to Lauren. I, I read Finis in my first, in my last year of law school. At least some of you might be three L's. And I think I understood half, half of the book. Now, I'm not saying this might serve any consolation because I don't think you need any consolation. So I'll proceed and tell you that the way Finis managed to make love happen, or to be more accurate, as it is often the case, the way to be Mrs. Finis managed to make love happen was, of course, a boat, a very long boat trip from Australia to England. You have many days there to converse and talk about many things. They went there to do a doctorate. She, in English literature, at the University of Cambridge, otherwise known as Cambridge University. That was supposed to be a joke. And um, she, to the University of Oxford, that some people call Oxford University. The truth is, there is only one right way, like, is it Notre Dame University or University of Notre Dame? There's only one right way, but I never remember which one it is. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So they went on a Rhodes Scholarship. Does anyone, except for you, just in case, know what a Rhodes Scholarship is? If they do, there are some dollars here waiting without technology, mind you. Not even a discrete phone. Nada. Like, I don't know what you have to do to be called, but is it like top, kind of like the top scholars in like the country? Which country? The U.S. The U.S. Now we're getting closer. Nice. Do I get a dollar? Where are they from the U.S.? <laughs> What's that? I'm joking if I get a dollar. That's sure. not up to me. I can't recommend. <laughs> but to answer your question, not yet. You haven't answered enough because they were obviously not from the U.S. He was indeed. He was also very fond of something called slavery. So now, you know, all the Rhodes scholars are really ashamed for something they didn't do. Because only recently this has been uncovered. But to be sure, all the statutes of Cecil B. Rhodes thrown down. This is like, as you said, what's your name again? Viviana. Viviana. It's like a name you have in my country, Argentina. We oh, have it with the two Bs. You're from Colombia. Yeah. Where in Colombia? Uh, near Pereira. Wonderful. I sadly I only know Bogota and only by name. Imagine my ignorance. How is it possible that I come to New Jersey and not to Colombia? I've been to Colombia, as they pronounce the, that place in Harlem, let's say. <laughs> well, the Rhodes Scholarship is, it, it means you're God. There comes the Rhodes Scholar and then God, basically. <laughs> and it's only open for graduates of jurisdictions that belonged to the British and belong to the British Commonwealth. So indeed, the United States that did belong to the British Commonwealth is still uh, 
part of the group that can aspire to do a doctorate, for example, in the UK, because they are for studies in the UK, in particular in Oxford, only in Oxford. In Oxford, there is a huge house. Now everyone is ashamed of it. It's beautiful, mind you, called Rose House, where the gods meet. They meet because, I don't know if you've seen the Percy Jacksons and all those things, the gods fall in love with each other. Now, if you're following my presentation, you should realize that I blundered because I said that Mrs. Finnis also went on a Rhodes Scholarship, but I said she went to one of the two, either Cambridge University or the University of Cambridge. So if I said that the Rhodes Scholars only go to Oxford, there's something wrong there. I need to revise my notes. And this is why it was such a good reason that you wouldn't take notes. You won't need to correct anything. <laughs> Never mind, because when they arrived and he went to Rhodes' house and other girls were looking at him, he was already trapped by the boat effect. And a year later, they got married in a Catholic church in England. Never to return to Australia, except for short trips and visits like that. Finis completed his doctorate on the idea of judicial power in Australian constitutional law in three years. Contrary to present custom, that PhD thesis was never published. Right now, there is a, a single PhD thesis that is not published, either as a bunch of articles or as a book. But in those days, it was different. He had as his supervisor, Professor H. L. A. Hart, who then was the star of philosophy of law in the English-speaking world in 1962, when Finnis arrived in Oxford. In 1960, his book, The Concept of Law, had been published, and it was like a revolution. The application of the analytical tools applied to language and to legal language. Now, Hart was an agnostic, a nihilist, all the things that Finnis had just left behind. So Finnis had sufficient empathy with Hart, who was also Jewish, to to feel like he had been in Hart's same boat until recently. And Hart was smart enough to realize that Finnis was smart enough not to be just a convert, a zealous Catholic, a new proselyte. He, Hart saw more. So although his agenda, Hart, went in this direction in all political issues, especially abortion, and finishes in this direction, which you would call the Catholic direction to simplify things. Hart was very respectful of his work, and it was hard to tell him, look, you write your dissertation on this topic, but you feel free to read Aristotle, Plato, Aquinas, the Catholic documents, and I want to learn from you. And Hart learned a lot from Finnis. He said this many times. Then Hart had a, a, an act of great enlightenment and commissioned the book that you have there and you there, Natural Law and Natural Rights, to John Finnis in Christmas of 1967. He had just returned Finnis to Oxford from his first teaching job. His first teaching job was in the United States at Berkeley or the University of California at Berkeley or Berkeley University. I don't know. One well, of Center for Natural Law Study and Teaching. There. Berkeley was. And it still is. Okay. Well, there he went. He did well. He was Hart who recommended him. You see how, again, Hart, who was like Phyllis, his nemesis, and 30 years his senior, he endorsed fully and because it finished came with Hart's recommendation at Berkeley, super liberal, now we would say woke place, then woke meant awoke. 
own uh, he was received gladly there now he's back in oxford 67 and hart probably realized that Venice is doomed that is his conversion through love is irreversible i've lost him so let's use him let's ask him to write a book that can explain to the world the ideas of Aristotle and Aquinas in a way that is acceptable for the analytical mind, in a world, way that will not produce my friends, hard thought, vomit, because they think, they will think, oh, this is holy water. St. Thomas Aquinas, again. No, Finis will do it differently. Thought hard. So, Finis was very honored, of course, by this commission. He realized this was going to be a lot of work. So, he thought that three years would make it and said, I'll have it ready by Christmas 1970. But it took him 13 years to write it. That is 10 years more. You can only guess why and perhaps you might be right he has six children he's a good father that kind of thing let's hope so but more probably or compatibly with this it proved very complicated to rewrite everything with the analytical tools and folded by the master in the 1960 book that i mentioned to you it was tough times. Now, if you read the chapter on obligation that you had a presentation on today, wow, that's like one of the most difficult ones. But if you go to the last one, and I think you will cover in a couple of weeks, my gosh, that day will be so terrible for you. Uh, yeah, so difficult, so difficult. But there you are, he made it. Hart was pleased. The goal was fulfilled. And a conversation started now in English around natural law theory that is still going on today that would have been impossible before 1980 because there were so many prejudices. Natural law is a Catholic thing. No, wait a minute. I was an agnostic when I discovered natural law. In fact, when I teach the undergraduates, when I teach philosophy of law to 18-year-old kids in Argentina, so that they understand, I tell them, but I am in this, I'm emulating Finis, that natural law, listen to this, is the religion of the atheist. The religion of the atheist. So then after class, the few believers in the class will come to me and will say, am I excluded then from natural law? What do you think? I won't ask you just in case. The religion of the atheist. I think that encapsulates. By the way, I'll make some, some commercials here. And I'll tell you that segments of a lecture I gave here some years ago were published um, by the Louisiana Law Review in an article called A New Natural Law Reading of the Constitution. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, let me interject here. That talk was very well received by our faculty, and many of whom said that's the first discussion of natural law that, I, that made any sense to me. So you did achieve uh, a rather remarkable uh, result from that. Uh, and I'm honored, I'm very glad to hear, but it would mean even perhaps more to me, if I could discern, but I will never be able to, if some of these ladies and gentlemen here have downloaded that article because they were intrigued now by your reference, but it's impossible, you know. You don't know who <laughs> um, A new natural law reading of the Constitution. Yeah. The reason I dare not recommend it, wouldn't recommend me, but the reason I mention it only is because it's 10 times easier than Finis. It's like Finis 
is an Argentine state. And this is means meat for babies, what I've done. So section one, what natural law is not, you'll never get that in fiddles. You'll have to find out what it's not. And then I explain why natural laws are not natural law. Then I explain why religion is not natural law. Enter the, reli the religion of the atheist. Then that's section one. But natural law is not. Section two is what? No, section two is natural law for dummies. Mind you, I'm not talking to you here. It's just the title of the, of the section. It's not addressed to anything in anyone in particular. Well, that was heart with Phoenix. You may know, or maybe not, that at the time Phoenix was a, a student and subsequently a young professor in Oxford before he went to Africa for two years and then back. There were two other stars in the jurisprudence firmament of Oxford, which is the same as saying there were two stars, so two other stars in the firmament of jurisprudence in England, which is the same to say at that time, there were three stars in the firmament of jurisprudence in the English speaking world, or as an American would put it, there were three stars in the world, because anything not in English doesn't exist. Um, that's uh, Americana 101. And until the Vivianas and Santiago's of the world emerged to take over, kind of. That was like a joke. All of us. <laughs> did, did I tell you the definition of a joke? Yeah. Let me tell you. Of course I did. A joke is when you don't know how to say something to someone, so you tell them a joke. <laughs> That's what you want to say. So, so whenever someone tells you some kind of joke and then says, just kidding, don't believe the just kidding part. Yes, three. Finn is actually the least famous of the three, even today, I have to recognize. The most famous, an American, Ronald Dworkin, who never did a doctorate and was like Professor Hart's nemesis, got his chair in Oxford when Hart retired but also got a chair at NYU. And Phyllis was up for that chair too, but he didn't get it working. Is that right? Yeah. Dworkin had this incredible ability that I had always seen in the movies of being a full-time professor in England and in the United States at the same time. It violates all the rules of- Well, the thing is, Dworkin was an eloquent speaker. He was, he was. And a handsome man, big uh, and bold. When he spoke, it sounded like he was coming from God himself. Where did you meet him? At uh, NYU? You no, know, at a conference where I met Finnis. Hi, Philadelphia. Philadelphia, the teaching of jurisprudence. So, Dwar and Dworkin, I read his Law's Empire and the Just Justice for Hedgehogs. And I, I one semester, I, I gave the, the assignment to the students in the jurisprudence class. Instead of reading Finnis, to read Dworkin. Well, after two weeks, I took the books back and paid for them myself and gave them this. Because what, what Dworkin does, in eloquent language, he explains things to a fairly well. A very accurate description, as good uh, parts of his art. He never claimed to be a natural lawyer anyway, but his descriptive analysis would go so far, and then he would talk about law's integrity, and essentially the judge's job is to put the decision in the context of the moral traditions, the, the moral traditions of the legal system and by the Constitution and its laws. But he never explains to you what the moral tradition is. And he goes right to the waterfront, never talks about morality, which I always found disturbing. Here's this guy putting so much emphasis upon the judge's role to uh, exercise integrity by interpreting the law in the light of the common moral tradition without talking about what morality is. What is the moral tradition? And of course, that's where I decided Finnis is all about morality. Natural law, from Finnis's point of view, is only metaphorically law. It's really it's principles of morality. And so my 
ultimate decision with Dworkin was, he's a good positivist, and positivism in their descriptive analysis have value, but they fall short of what we need as for in, an integrative jurisprudence, where you take the truth of positivism, but you reject its exaggerations, where you, and you take the, the truth of the realist and the other, the feminist and the, every variety of legal theory, because they all have a germ of truth, mm -hmm. sometimes more or less truth. All of them have something to, 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 to gain from. But for the most part, unless you integrate those different ideas into a sound framework, which is what Finnis gives us, the framework for thinking about the relationship of all laws. Do you remember what year that conference was? 1983 or 84? I think it may be 84. Okay, well, here's the joke. Now that you know what a joke is. The joke is that working writes much better than Finnis and it's way more enthralling, but it's false. Yeah. <laughs> Up to a point. As, as Professor Ambrosio says, there are gems of truth in everything. So I guess you could say there are some gems of falsity in Finnis, but they're small. Anyways, your name, please. Chris. Chris. Who would be the third tower or star of this universe of the world or Marvel or Oxford? Marvel. Yeah, I have no idea. DC? Is it? No. Sorry? DC? Marvel? No. Nada. Joseph? I don't know. Joseph Rass, who came from Israel to study with Professor Hart. I don't know if it would be, it would be John Rawls. No, John Rawls is a political philosopher, but in terms of his contribution to the interest in natural law, he probably had as much influence as Yeah, but, but he wasn't in Oxford. These oh, were yeah, these, these were right. hard students, okay. the three hard students. Ross, to be John sure. Rawls is of Hart's right. generation. Right. Right. And it's probably more important than the four of them, I agree. Although he wasn't a legal theorist, John he was Rawls. a political theorist, really. Yeah. But you know, famous in this book, he probably refers to Rawls a hundred times. So there are lots of interactions. But this is well, Joseph Rass. Finnis has the distinction of being, like Aristotle, a philosopher that blurs the distinction between legal, moral, and political theory. There I find him to be most convincing because the, the element of relating what is seemingly unrelated is what makes for a profound philosophy. One of the things that he treasure Einstein for because he took the three elements, time, energy, and mass. And he found a relationship between the two that no one else did. He changed the world. So people who see relationships between that which is seemingly unrelated are the powerful influence in the end mm -hmm. than those with lesser mm -hmm. interest and lesser mm -hmm. descriptions uh, do, don't, don't achieve. Yeah. It's a limited yeah. vision. Yeah. Well, what was the difference between Finnis and these other two, Joseph Rass, a genius who recently died, and Ronald Gordon, another genius who died, people would say, prematurely. He looks so healthy too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the main difference I would like to say, and I put it on the table as an extra reason for you to give Finnis a chance, is that Finnis is more interested than Ras and Dworkin in the law, in cases. He practiced law, he was a barrister. I'm speaking of Finnis as, as if he wouldn't be alive. He is a barrister. He had a case last year because he is, he's very lucid, doing super well at the moment, although he retired from his academic positions, from the one in Oxford at the mandatory age there of 67. And in the US, as you may know, there isn't for academics a mandatory age of retirement. It has been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. What are you looking at, Reagan? Um, but he's been he's been teaching Notre Dame. He's still teaching Notre Dame. <laughs> That's a, now she's blushing. Uh, um, yes, he's he still teaching Notre Dame. He doesn't because during during COVID, they offered forty 
what's the word? Not old, right? 40, what should I say? Plus something faculty, a very good package of retirement and Finis didn't want to travel so much with COVID and all this and he took the package. Otherwise he would still be teaching. So he has this interest in the practicality. So for example, there is a section in this book on bankruptcy. You will never get that in RAS or in Gorky. There is, for example, a professor in Argentina, he teaches administrative law, never studied philosophy of law. He read this book, he fell in love with this book, and now he applies it to administrative law in Argentina. Then you have cases like this ambassador or diplomat, Finis met one time at a cocktail party and then told me that this guy, maybe he was like 70 years old, he said that when he was the age of some of you, he came across this book, he got it, and now has it by his bed on a table, and he reads every night a bit of natural law and natural rights. Now, that would be the dream of Professor Ambrosius if you ever did that, like the best possible birthday present. Well, I told him the story how I came and got finished the book at the Blackstone Bookstore. Oh, oh I, in Oxford. I spent five hours. I couldn't put the book down. I had read all these philosophers, including Lonigan, for 13 years on the faculty. And I was going off for a visiting professorship in, in, in Italy. Yeah. And I got, came across this book and I started to read it. And I, for five and a half hours, I was at that bookstore. Yes. So, so well, I was seeing how much he was speaking sense. It made sense. Uh, well, I'm sure that you would be content if they read five minutes. Not five long words like that. It well, I, I have to say I have lots of hope for students that I don't have for faculty. Let yeah. me just say, but this is being recorded, you That's know. That's all right. <laughs> all right. I, I, I had the wonderful experience last Friday of speaking to 85 administrative law judges about jurisprudence in general and Finnis's view in natural law in particular, and found a engagement that I was quite surprised with. Mm. People came up afterward and uh, applauded the you, effort. So there's hope in this world. You know, here, here we have uh, varying ages of those administrative law judges mm -hmm. open to rethinking their understanding of law beyond the mm -hmm. positivism and legal realism with its yeah. narrow descriptive analysis. These guys thought they came here to be instructed on law and morality, but now you know better. There is hope in this world. I agree. So, another joke. <laughs> Remember the ambassador, the book, the table by his bed every night? The Bible of the atheist. Natural law and natural rights. Well, I've funny. just made it up. It's funny you should say that because in this course of my three and a half hours with these judges of the administrative law court, I, I referenced the book, the Bible, and a book, Finnis, uh, and, and as dominant influences in my life. Yeah, I, I read the Bible six times through, through a Bible uh, daily reading plan, yeah. and I still read the Bible regularly. But Finnis, uh, I've probably read through it with students 30 times, and I never cease to marvel how much truth it is, and, and also how difficult it is for students to encounter it for the first time. So I'm constantly counseling people to do the best you can, and you get what you can, and so maybe, maybe you have yeah. to read it, maybe yeah. you have to. But, but there's enough to be gained with the struggle. You, you don't get it all. Uh, you just continue to struggle. That's the yeah. point. Or if worse comes to worse, you can always read a translation. You know what I mean? That would be like another joke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the most important translations are from English to English. Can you be more clear with me, please? Translate. Yes, yes, yes. So I have here, I have like 10 minutes left, maybe five, maybe 15, more likely 10. And I have some more things to say here. And I will. But I would prefer not to. 
I don't think they would make any difference. So I would prefer, but maybe this is too much asking. Let me tell you first, I wrote an article, believe it or not, way more important than, than that one, called Overcoming Shyness. Google it after we're done. So if, if overcoming shyness, you would like to engage me in conversation and ask me, how is this polyamorous long distance relationship with someone who is my father's age interesting or possible? I'm all yours. If not, I go back to my notes. Silence is crucial. The clock is ticking. Let's give it a minute. Yes, and your name is? This is My name is Emily. Emily, tell me. Uh, I don't know if you already said this, but how did you meet Finis? How did I meet Finis? Well, you know, like all love story, it, the beginnings are very important. I was uh, finishing law school and a priest in Argentina. I was 23 years old then. Uh, law is a very long undergraduate degree. And when I studied, it was six years. So I was in sixth year, now it's five. But of course, then you don't do anything else. You, it's not like you're four plus three kind of. And I was in sixth year doing jurisprudence and this priest with whom I would occasionally go for confession to, he said, perhaps you're interested in this book. And he gave me a copy of the book. It is so useful when they give you something expensive, isn't it? Um, I glanced at it, I thought, mm -mm, no, this is not for now. I need to study for my papers, my exams. My professor of jurisprudence doesn't know who Finis is. This is not going to be useful. Let's leave it aside. Then I got my first job. I clerked for the Argentine Supreme Court, which unfortunately, is way less posh and prestigious than to clerk for Washington, D.C. But put it at a maybe Jersey Supreme Court level, so not too bad. And as I was clerking, I read the book. It took me one year. As I said, I understood half. But I thought, I like this man because he has two qualities that I never found together. He writes in English, which is the language of the future, or the job would be the language of dominion, of conquer, of imperium, etc. Um, and he's a Christian, which I was and am. So these two together, you know, you don't get. The smart guys, I always thought, are always agnostic, always. Especially if they write in English, that was my imagination, which I thought was quite correct. So I thought I need to meet this guy. So three years later, I knew of a professor in Argentina who was friends with Finnis, and I asked him if he could write a letter for me of presentation of my person to Finnis. And I organized a short summer trip to Europe that included a stop in Oxford. And I went with my letter to the Porter's Lodge of his college that later down the road became my college when I studied there. And I said to the Porter, I'm here to ask after Professor Finnis. There was no email. Email was starting in those days. We're in 1995. I hadn't called nothing. The Porter says, but this is very Oxford-like. He says, go there, there is a kind of landline, but it's not a landline, to communicate with the different rooms where the fellows are. 
dial 234. I dial 234, and the voice says, John Finnis. <laughs> I was like, Ugh. I was like blushing, <laughs> like, you know, I am from Argentina. Ah, would you like to come tomorrow? So that was, that's how it started. Easy, easy. It isn't easy, though. He's very intimidating, but because he's very courteous, um, did you find him intimidating? You probably didn't. I did. I was like terrified. I found him to be so gentle. He's so gentle. soft-spoken. Yeah. And so clear-minded that when he spoke, I, everything he said just seemed to fit mm. what you'd expect a great philosopher to say. I had read Plato and Aristotle and so many other philosophers. And to see in the flesh someone who could speak so eloquently and so directly about what's most important, that impressed me no end. Mm -hmm. And I spent two hours walking with him through the uh, convention center. It was in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. So I, I, had, I had about three hours. Uh, first, we had lunch together, and it was really an eye-opening experience mm -hmm. because whatever love I had for fitness was affirmed by meeting the man. Because sometimes someone once said, if you don't like somebody, you can't learn from them. Uh, and Lonigan is kind of a Funny guy, many people thought Lonigan was sort of a nasty, sour. Mm. And, and I re always remember John Hoy from Loyola, he's long since dead now. But he would always say he couldn't buy Lonigan's ideas because he knew him too well. <laughs> he thought he was a nasty old man. Mm. So, <laughs> so there, there, there is this question about what is that the manner of the presentation can be as important as the presentation itself. So for me, at least, Venice was not intimidating in the least. In well, that's any, interesting. Uh, Maybe you were older. When you well, were I was older. older. I, I was older than you. And I had 13 years in philosophy teaching. Right. And I had suffered fools for most of those things. I, I, I hadn't started teaching when I met Finis. But Finis, in my opinion, or as an arrogant would say, in my humble opinion, Finis is not a good teacher. No, he's not what you think. No, he's, he, he he's very writes. Dry, he's very, very dry. It's just and that he's writing he's sometimes so very technical because remember, he wrote for the analytical yeah. skeptics. He, he was writing this book to try to convince the positivists to embrace, embrace natural law. So he sometimes took their uh, analytical style to an extreme when he talked yeah. about those, those diagrams now, he puts in. Do you think, do you think there's hope? Hope for another question, maybe, or just I end think, it. Oh, I think so. Let's another question. Let's hope. Let's hope. Let's, hope on. let's listen to the clock. There's a question. There is. There is. One always needs to look like this. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Who oh, are okay. you now? I'm Emily. Another um, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you met Emily? Yeah. Yeah, we have. Oh. Yeah. Um, so you said that. Was a joke. Right. <laughs> um, you you said that finesse is like the religion for atheists. Um, do you think that's just because finesse was writing from the analytical frame, like for the analytical framework, or do you think there's something more to the way finesse approaches natural law theory that makes it more, uh, I don't know, endearing to non-believers? Thank you for that question. Good question. I. I think the latter. I think it isn't mainly because he was using the analytical tools, but mostly because he was playing a game, an exercise, which I play often. And the exercise is to suppress momentarily as an exercise his religious belief and check if the argument he's making say about whatever, uh, whether lying is wrong or torture or a good goal is wrong, whether the argument works regardless of Jewish, Muslim, Christian convictions. Now for him to, to play this game and do this exercise was easier because for a long time he had been thinking about the same issues without religious belief. Does that make sense to you? But for example, 
in my case, and maybe case of some of you, I appeal to this or that in my arguments, depending on who is sitting with me at the same table or whether they are drinking or not. <laughs> and what are they drinking? So then you may you may need to resort to stronger religious arguments, you know. Uh, well, you know, when you read the last chapter, which is a very difficult chapter, I make a point to note the discussion of Aristotle and Plato's belief that through their meditation they came into contact with the divine. So these two great uh, theorists, philosophers, they had uh, an understanding that the ultimate reality is perhaps God. Now, they didn't define God. They didn't talk about the nature of God. They just talked about the connection that they made in their meditation. Well, as we wrap it up and we finish at the right time, I will leave you my email here in case you want to discuss any of these topics further. Case you have thank you very much. You have time to wonderful presentation because yes, sure. you led you led us to understand that the man uh, behind these thoughts uh, had qualities that uh, one uh, appreciates in any human being, but particularly in a philosopher. Yeah, to start out man. To start out with the nihilism and to counter that nihilism with philosophy that puts. So much substance mm. behind the notion of the good, his, his discussion of exhaustive theory of the good and his robust theory of practical reasons. I, I, that's that's the heart of my my uh, profound affection for Finnis, because he never lose sight of the importance of identifying the good to be achieved. Those goods are achievement ones. And he never fails to give us some entree into a process of thinking that moves us to decide how to achieve the good. And that's what practical reasons is all about. And as a lawyer, I can tell you, my, my life as a lawyer was changed radically when I understood how to focus upon the good I'm trying to achieve my, for my client and, and, and how I'm going to do it by putting that case within the context of the requirements of what is practically reasonable. Asking for my client, not anything that would be solely in her interest, but in the common interest. And that's, that's the key to good lawyering, when you connect your case to the broad public interest, public morality, and the idea that these fundamental rights that we respect uh, are always there as a uh, language, the language of rights is there to supplement our, uh, as Finnis says, you supplement the natural law uh, principles by this language of rights that focus upon how those rights at the core are needs. Mm -hmm. We have a right and we have a moral claim to what we need. So this is really good stuff. And, and for me, every year when I teach it, I'm more and more convinced that it ought to be part of the lawyering course in the first year. Students should be rather than the silly stuff that they do. They learn how to interview. I don't. I don't know what they do in that course. Six credits. <laughs> six credits. I, I, you guys have taken that lawyering course, correct? And six credits of a lot of play. It's like kindergarten. Your first students? No, these are third. No, sir. Oh, they all had. They all had. You all had that lawyering. Yeah. Okay. And I'm in favor of clinical education. Fine, but somehow or other, something about that course just offends me. <laughs> I like the people who teach it. They're good people. And they do make an effort to be high-minded and give you some perspective about the profession as a whole. But boy, what lawyers need more than anything else is this foundation on how to make arguments that sound in truth and that are connected to what is reasonable and incorporate justice. These are, these are the thoughts that a first-year student ought to have. So they go the next two years, they're asking bigger questions rather than or you want the rules over. Very good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for your attention.
these students know how lucky you are to be part of the kind of intellectual discourse that so very seldom takes place ever. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to observe and see how much whatever they say connects with what I know and what I think. Because frankly, we go through life very few opportunities to actually engage in true intellectual study. You should appreciate what you just experienced and hope to replicate it as often as you can. Thank you. And they're going to leave the discussion. That's the well, point. Well, you know, we're going to have we have to have a cat. You know, I, I, I really saved them themselves. I always want young girls with the idea that when they're looking for a name, you have to talk about high mindedness. Because if you don't find in your particular object.